Welcome everyone, Costine here with my guide for Total War Warhammer 3 as Cafe on Legendary Difficulty. Though you can apply what I'm about to say in this video on every other difficulty as well, it will work much better than, uh, than on Legendary, of course. So, as Cafe, you have a choice between two Legendary Lords. You either have Miao Ying, which I've chosen to play in this uh, video, or you have the Western Provinces of Xiao Ming. Xiao Ming has a much easier position at the start but he's gonna have the same problems eventually as Miao Ying and the problems are that the Great Bastion needs to be defended from Chaos Incursions coming in from here from the Chaos Waste that he's got Ogres and Zinch and eventually Nurgle potentially coming in to deal with uh, so I feel that Miao Ying sure she has a harsher start a much harder start uh, but she's um, in a much better position to Put Cafe in a, situ in a state of affairs where you can really take advantage of that in the early game. Like, Xiao Ming is easier in the early game. Uh, Miao Ying is easier in the late game as I see it. On top of that, Miao Ying, she just ends up having better armies. Why is that? Because the benefits that she has, that uh, her faction has in particular for range units, like 50% upkeep for missile units, you're going to use missile units. The only... You don't want to stack melee units unless you can get ogre units, but that depends on a network of alliances with ogres. Maybe Zhang Mian can achieve that, maybe, but relying on diplomacy for your army is a very Ready tricky affair. It is possible, don't get me wrong, relying on ogre mercenaries, Ready but he has melee bonuses, she has range bonuses, she also has a corruption bonus uh, for her faction. And so I, I feel like Miao Ying is just ultimately the superior faction to play. Now, Cafe, they have, what do they have? What are their core faction mechanics? Uh, well, first off, you have the Great Bastion, which is a series of walls, basically free settlements. I'm actually just gonna go to uh, to these fellows right here, get military access, non-aggression pact, etc. Uh, with them, and then go to the Celestial Loyalist. Like, this is one of the first things you wanna do, by the way. And eventually you'll be able to get military lines, but the Great Bastion is basically free walls. The Saint Gate, Dragon Gate, the Turtle Gate. Uh, two of these gates start under the control of of the Imperial Wardens, who also start with the settlement in the Chaos Waste, but the Snake Gate is destroyed. Now, the Great Bastion mechanic works as such. You Constantly, you will have Kurgan Warband spawning in the Chaos Wastes. The, and every turn, you will get this meter filling up, especially if those Warbands, those weaker Warbands, are left uh, on their own. Eventually, this meter will fill up, and when it does, you will have a massive invasion by multiple stacks of enemy troops attacking the entirety of the Great Bastion. And you want to stop them at the Great Bastion. If they start getting into cafe and territory, they're going to cause a lot of damage and a lot of havoc. Now, the Great Bastion is basically a series of walled settlements that are very difficult to take. And you also have the ability to maintain powerful armies for very ch uh, very cheaply there and recruit powerful units. So uh, you do have benefits for hoarding Great Bastion. That's the first mechanic. Um, the second mechanic is the harmony mechanic, yin and yang, balancing that. Um, yin and yang is dependent on your heroes, your lords, and your buildings, uh, uh, your, uh, your buildings and your research. So you have all of those things to take into consideration. So buildings can, many buildings, especially economic, public order and all that, can add yin or yang, depending on the building in question. Typically, what I find is that yin is better for economic buildings, like they will increase uh, your economy, they will improve that. Uh, yang is more uh, on other buildings, like for instance, the tea parlor versus the labor conscription burial. Like you can have lower construction costs for buildings or you can get them per, uh, 2 percent income for buildings, which goes up to 6%. So there's various benefits. And ideally you want to manage a balance between yin and yang so that you have all these bonuses. If you go too far ahead one side, you're going to suffer significantly. Like if you go, let's say yin four to six, you're going to lose six control. So your public order is going to go uh, down by six. You want to have the balance because you get an enormous economic benefit. You get minus corruption in all your provinces. You get eight control. Now it's very, very easy to get out of this uh, because 
Um, because buildings give you a Noriang. And if you lose a building, let's say a settlement sacked, or you lose that settlement, uh, then you lose the buildings, and that throws you out of balance. You have heroes that add you know Yang. Like if you look, um, I, I can't show you because I don't have a hero here. But heroes also like you have two hero types. You have astromancers and alchemists, and regardless of what you're recruiting, they may be yin or yang, and each of them adds one yin or yang. Then you have lords, and lords add free yin or yang. So you're constantly having to balance this. It actually can be frustrating when, say for instance, oh, I want to balance uh, yin. Like, let's say I wanted to balance that. What I do here is I would just get uh, him with free yang. And there, that's the balance on turn one. But here's the problem. That's not going to last because on top of that, there are events. So for instance, this event, if I defeat this army here, and I'm just going to auto resolve it. I would not recommend you have to resolve this battle because you lose that unit there. Though that's not really important anyway. But you have to resolve this battle, you get an Astromancer. He's Yin, Yin 1, right? So that's going to throw it out of balance. That Astromancer. By the way, um, when it comes to heroes, you almost always want, uh, want to have Alchemist. I'll explain why that is in just a moment. But yeah, you have to maintain this balance. You have events. You also have events popping up that might give you six yin or yang, which is quite a lot and might throw you out of balance. Then there's research. So yin is all everything at the bottom across the entire tree. The middle tree, just the very middle of it, is uh, balanced and won't add either. And yang is everything at the top. There's some pretty solid, powerful research here. The one thing I would almost certainly, uh, almost certainly uh, get in every campaign is the fletchling... Uh, Fletching mentors, because that eight percent ammunition for peasant archer units is going to be significant, uh, very significant for you as a player. Then there's other things that you want uh, to worry about, various research that you want to worry about later on that is going to be important, like range, uh, range unit upgrades in particular, because you are going to want to get a predominantly ranged army, though not strictly a ranged army. You want to throw in a couple of melee units, not too many, just a couple. Uh, like two, three, four, and most, so you get the bonus in battle. Because Cafe also has a, the yin and yang system in battle. Now, units are either yin or yang. Now, this doesn't affect your meter in the campaign. It would be very frustrating. But what it does is affect things in battle. Basically, y units have like a circle around them, an influence circle around them. Independent. And if you get yin and yang units to be together, they get various bonuses. Melee bonus, reload skill, range bonuses, all that. You don't need this, but it's a nice bonus. And I think it's worth it uh, to have it than just going, say, a full range doom stack uh, from my personal perspective. So that's one of the main things uh, to worry about. You have to plan ahead. For some people, this is incredibly frustrating. To be honest, playing on Nigeria, yes, I felt some frustration. And it can be a, 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 a exceptionally frustrating, but you do get used to it and you do plan ahead of it. Even confederating with other factions doesn't end up being that bad because the, AI, the cafe and AI factions actually do build their settlements for the most part fairly balanced. Like They care about balance as well. Generally, confederating will throw your balance out of whack, but it's not difficult to get it back, uh, back uh, together. So, that's another major thing. So you have the bastion, you have the harmony mechanic, then you have the compass. So how does how does the compass work? Well, every uh, ten turns or so, though you can reduce this with certain research, but every ten turns or so, you will be able to select one of the benefits here. Uh, from the compass. So you've got Great Bastion, Warp Sun Desert, Dragon Emperor's Wrath, and Celestial Lake. Now these kind of benefits, uh, and the way it works is you fill up one of these meters, and for these three, the Warp Sword Desert only works when you hold it, when you, the compass is aimed there. So you have benefits that depend on these meters, like control, growth, defense supplies, etc. But then you also have, uh, you also have benefits only when the compass is pointing in a certain direction. So you point the compass, and for those 10 turns, eight turns, however many turns it takes to switch the compass direction, you are gonna get like either income or Great Bastion for Red Reduce, or for the Dragon Emperor's Wrath, uh, extreme attrition applied to armies beyond the Great Bastion. This is not particularly useful, I gotta say. It can be useful when you have a lot of armies and you're being besieged by a Great Bastion, it can be useful to really reduce those armies, but outside of that, not significantly important. 
though obviously the control benefit can be very, very good. Generally, it's either Celestial Lake or Dragon Emperor's Wrath that I feel is important, though you can obviously benefit from the Great Bastion for the casualty replenishment rate and the recruitment cost and Celestial Intervention. But yeah, mostly control or growth. I'd probably say growth at the start, control later on. Though the growth one also gives you, when you have the compassing there, it's 15% income increase from buildings. So that's uh, pretty, pretty enormous. And then finally you have caravans. So uh, there's a whole tutorial on caravans, but I'll just go over it very quickly. So you start with one caravan. Now I think the caravan will be randomized every time you start a campaign. So for instance, in this case, uh, I got the fellow who has... Uh, He's got uh, ranged benefits, and he has additional gunpowder units. So he has Sky Lanterns, which are flying units. They're pretty solid, actually. The, they do have some issues. They, their ammunition isn't as good as it could be. Uh, and there's also a better version called Sky Junk. You start as with one of those Sky Junks. The amount of damage that they, these guys can put out is pretty significant, but... Uh, they, they're they only flying, they can't land. They do have some abilities to hit units on the ground, even when uh, they run out of ammo, but they will run out of ammo. But anyway, the way the caravan system works is at the start of the campaign, you start with a caravan, and you can only have one active caravan. I don't think there's any way to increase that count. It would be nice to have multiple caravans at the same time. Then you choose a region where you want to send the caravan to. And dependent on distance, uh, dependent on distance, and as well as a bit of RNG who holds the territory or relations with them, all that. Uh, the caravan will generate more money when it reaches the destination, but it may take significantly more time to reach that destination. So, for instance, I can send them to Shattered Stone Bay. There's some ogres there. That, that would give me 3,000. It would take six turns. Or I can send them to Erengrad. That would give me about 5,000, but it would take 9 turns. I feel Erengrad is probably the better choice because there's various events that can happen. And long-distance caravans are something you want to do perhaps more so early on in the campaign when things are safer because things are going to get perilous. But here's the thing. Caravans that travel around the route, beyond the fact that they can be wiped out by enemy armies, uh, they can be attacked and wiped out. So, for instance, right here, the caravan is at danger because the territory control is by the Dissenter Lords of Jinshin. Beyond that, beyond the fact factions can actually attack and destroy these caravans, you will also usually get an event with ogres attacking the caravan. Now, the ogre armies depend on the, the risk involved in a region. Uh, as far as I know, the strength of the caravan, so I think there's some kind of scaling, like the stronger your caravan is, the more likely you're going to find the strong ogre army. But these are these battles are pretty fucking easy and a joke to fight for the most part. Um, it's annoying that you actually have to fight them because the auto resolve in this game is pretty bad. So, either way, you send the caravan, when it reaches its destination, you will get some gold. Uh, but you also have events. You can fight the ogres. You don't necessarily need to fight the ogre, random ogre events. You can sacrifice some of your cargo or some of your units. I really don't recommend you sacrifice your units from a caravan because you can't recruit units in the caravan. You can get some events to get more units in the caravan, but by default, you can't get any units. So the units you have in a caravan are going to be all the units that you have. For the entirety. Now this caravan would be pretty damn sweet because if you look at it, like this guy has uh, Jade Warrior Crossbowmen, Peasant Archers, and he gets experience for these units for quite a bit. So I'm just going to recruit him from the from the start. You'll also get the caravans of a faction, the caravans of uh, an ally faction. When you confederate to them, they'll show up on this list. Most of them you'll probably just want to do away with. You don't need them. Though you may want to keep them for various purposes. It's pretty easy to lose a caravan when you're moving it through hostile territory. One of the important things is keep the mountains of Morn clear as much as possible. Eventually, you're likely going to get end up in a war with ogres, maybe Greece himself. That's going to be a problem. That's when you, all your caravan trading is going to stop. Because if you send a caravan through Greece's territory when you're at war with him, he will destroy it. Uh, also, demons will attack the caravan. So if you're sending one towards uh, for Kislev territory when towards the mid-late game, when Kislev is infested by demons, you're likely going to lose it. Actually, that's what happened. I was about to finish the caravan, get 10,000 gold, and then he got attacked by a massive demon army, and I lost everything. So, yeah. Uh, so, caravans are very vulnerable, but pretty lucrative. And you don't have to worry about movement or anything. Sometimes you just have to deal with events. 
Uh, many times you may get some extra units like uh, Imperial Captains, Alpha Nobles, all that kind of stuff added to your caravan uh, roster. So those are the Cafean mechanics. What about the Cafean army, you might ask? Well, when we're looking at the Cafe army, if you're playing Miao Ying, you want to destroy this building. Uh, you start with the ability to recruit iron and hail gunners, but and although they're pretty decent because they do have armor piercing, as opposed to the peasant archers who just don't have that armor piercing capability, the problem with iron hail gunners is that their range is significantly reduced compared to the peasant archers, and also they have lower ammunition because guess what? The benefit that you have as Mian Ying, the the benefits that you might get research wise, well. They apply to them, they don't apply to Iron Hail Gunners. Iron Hail Gunners, just not worth it. This is... Now, when you're thinking about Cafe, let me actually just go to the building browser. Now, when you're thinking about uh, things as Cafe, uh, your main army early on is going to be made up of peasant archers. You can recruit them in any, prov any province as long as you have a settlement building. So. If you have that, you can recruit peasant unit, uh, peasant Ready archers and peasant long spears. Don't bother with the long spears unless you absolutely need to have some melee units. Get the peasant archers; they're pretty solid units, and that's going to be your initial stack of troops. Okay, so using peasant ice. archers, full range uh, doom stack from the start. Uh, As yeah. will also start with the sky junk, celestial dragon crossbowmen, jade warriors, and celestial dragon guard. Now towards the mid game, the uh, towards the mid game when you're looking at the building browser, uh, you, what you will want to do, and likely in a minor settlement, will be to get the Jade Barracks and get Jade Warriors. Some of them with Halberds, just to fa have some melee units. They're pretty solid against anti large and you m will face a lot of large units. And you might need some units to hold the line. They're useful in sieges. Melee is useful in sieges. Yeah, you need them. Um, but mainly you're going to want to get Jade Warrior Crossbowmen. And then eventually, and, and artillery-wise, you don't want to bother with cavalry, it's useless. But then eventually, what you want to get, artillery-wise, uh, you may get crane gunners. Crane gunners, are, like our hail gunners, are actually really solid as units. But what you really want is the fire rain silo, and you want to get the fire rain rocket. These are basically Hellstorm rocket batteries that are faster and just as good, just as deadly. So you want the combination of fire rain rockets and likely some grand cannons. Um, I feel like both of them are really good in their own way, shape, or form. I personally have both in my armies, uh, like towards the mid game, and then eventually towards the very, very end game, uh, you want to get some terracotta sentinels. These are really powerful units in melee. They can hold the line like no other, and because they're just one unit and a big one, like. You can have them in the middle of an army, draw as much attention to them as possible, and then blow blow everything around them up with using artillery. They're really good for cafe, using them as melee units. And my doom stack for the actual end game will probably be a combination of terracotta sentinels uh, to to just as line holders more so than anything else. Terracotta sentinels, celestial dragon crossbowmen and Celestial Dragon Guard units. This is to fight Bellacord at the Forge of Souls to be able to win the campaign. And of course, artillery, right? Uh, Caster-wise, let's talk a bit about casters. You have two choices. You have Astromancers or Alchemists. Uh, well, Astromancers, the problem I, I have with Astromancers is we look at Astromancers. Okay, they have Harmonic Convergence, Rolling Skies, Thunderbolt, etc. Right, so they have uh, this type of magic. It's pretty good, it's pretty solid, but the benefits that they offer on a campaign, they just give you magic item drop chance, increase control, steal analogy. Okay, that's all well and fine. Then they're decent casters, but they're not the most important that you can get. What you really want to get are alchemists. Now, alchemists will do something, will increase your movement range in an army, and you can upgrade that even further. So alchem and they also have lore of metal, and so alchemists they're just as good in terms of magic, though obviously in a different way. They're just as good in terms of magic, but they are go gonna no give you a great deal of more flexibility on the campaign map because of the movement range increase. So my advice is astromancers are not that important. 
uh, alchemists are. Do get astromancers. You want to get the astromancer building because of the research benefits. So you will want some astromancers. I would mainly use them as agents around the map to close rifts when the rifts appear. Uh, especially when you're looking at the second set, the first set of rifts. When you start getting a lot of territory, you want to close the rifts. You don't want to deal with that. That's when you want to have astromancers doing that. They're pretty decent at it. And for your armies, I'd actually just use alchemists for the sake of an army. I do feel like the hero selection of Cafe is kind of limited. Like, you don't have a melee hero. Uh, and your heroes, your regular heroes, are not really that great in melee either. I mean, the dragons, yeah, sure, Miao Ying is a solo, uh, single entity doomstack. And her brother is even better at that because he has... Um, HP regeneration. By the way, that's that's by the way a bit of a problem that Meowing doesn't have HP regeneration. I mean, she does have a spell for it, but she can't do it in dragon form. Like they have human form and dragon form. When they're in human form, they can cast spells. When they're in dragon form, they are dragons and they're really powerful and useful. But they're the only lords that are actually really good uh, in melee uh, for the entirety of cafe. So in hero duels, you're more likely than not going to lose. And that can be a problem because you're going to be dealing with a lot of powerful heroes uh, that are going to be a problem and you need to deal with them. You, sure, you can snipe them using ranged units, but still a bit of a problem that Cafe doesn't have that kind of flexibility. And by the way, you're going to deal with, mel with heroes coming in from, uh, or lords coming in from the castways, and you can't waste Miao Ying or your legend, or Xiang Miao. Uh, you can't use, uh, you can't waste them holding the Bastion. If you ever have to hold the Bastion with them, then you're wasting your most powerful army. Like, holding the Bastion should be a concern for your secondary armies. Now, with all that said about mechanics and the concern, and the roster, army, etc., how. What's your goal in terms of a campaign? I'm going to focus on Miao Ying, not on her brother. Her brother has a much easier time, a lot more flexibility. But as Miao Ying, you do have a pretty, pretty much a set path in some way. You do have some flexibility as well. So your immediate concern, first two turns, you're going to take the mines. Uh, destroy this building, set up a spice market, uh, fight the battle there. Don't out resolve it like I did. I just did it for the purpose of the video. And then get... Uh, deals with the uh, factions of Cafe, the Imperial Wonder Wardens and the Celestial Loyalists. These two are, by the way, your main, uh, are going to be the two main factions that you're going to confederate uh, as Miao Ying. And even maybe as her brother. Anyway, you start with good relations with them. You want to maintain good relations. Keep in mind, the AI, all AI factions get significant bonuses on Legendary, and that includes them. Don't be in a rush to confederate them, especially if they're doing well. If they're doing poorly, or if they're not doing anything, or if, yeah, just not doing significant, yeah, then confederate them. But if they're doing well, if, for instance, the Imperial Wardens are holding the Great Bastion pretty well and upgrading it and have significant armies at it, don't confederate them, because that's going to cost you gold. You're not going to benefit from that. Uh, don't be in a rush. In one of my campaigns, they lost the Great Bastion. They were reduced uh, They were reduced to one, two settlements. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to confederate the good. Those settlements benefit from them. And by the way, while it... By the way, when it comes to holding the Great Bastion, you may want to take control of it as quickly as possible because the AI will not do a great job holding the Great Bastion. This is one of the main reasons I would say that if you're playing Cafe, you want to play Miao Ying because she's not necessarily going to do a great job holding the Great Bastion if uh, my experience with the Imperial Wardens has been any indication. I mean, she probably will stop the Cafe, uh, will stop the Chaos Armies in Cafe and territory before they get to you, but you really want to hold the Great Bastion. Sorry, first two turns, Mines of Nanyang. Now, one of your goals will be to get the Snake Gate. It's going to take two turns to get an army. You should recruit a Lord and Nangao and send them towards the Snake Gate as quickly as possible. But one of your biggest concerns early on is not to take Nanli. You could d d go directly from the Mines of Nanyang towards Nanli. You could do that and take it quickly. You're... You may not hold it, though, because the Dissenter Lords are going to start sending armies and you will have other concerns. But one of the biggest concerns is uh, the gar is the force here at the Terracotta Graveyard. This uh, this location is heavily fortified. They have a garrison of 15, so they have a garrison structure there. And on top of that, since this is legendary, they'll also pull out a full stack of troops. How do you deal with that? Well, you use the ambush trick. So what do I mean by that? You switch to amb uh, just to... to uh, demonstrate that you move a lord like this uh, fellow right here 
just slightly ahead towards it, and then you move Miao Ying and ambush stands right behind them. They or in front of him, really rather, uh, and the, uh, the AI will march out to deal with your single lord because they'll see him as an easy target, and you will wipe him out. Yes, the cheese is strong on legendary and total war Warhammer in general. And once you've uh, and then you lay siege to the Terracotta graveyard. It doesn't matter if you don't uh, if you can hold if you can take Nanli before that. That's great. You will need a full stack of troops to take the Terracotta graveyard. Don't count on your allies doing crap uh, at this, and you might lose all of the Great Bastion and have Chaos Invaders while you're doing it. But you really want to deal with this faction of Zinch, ASAP. Because if you don't, they're just going to be a continuous form on your side. Once you've dealt with that, you will have other concerns. Skaven, Clannish, and dealing with the Decentral Lords, all that. Now, ideally, in an ideal situation, you'll send an army, a single Lord, he'll rebuild the Snake Gate, the other gates won't fall. More realistically, the, AI, the Imperial Wardens will do a mess of things, they'll lose all of the gates on the Great Bastion, and you're going to be forced to send Miao Ying there to stabilize the situation initially. That's the only case I'd say where you should really send her. Anytime you have to send her to the Great Bastion to save the situation, it's time you're losing. Outside of an initial uh, situation where I lost, where they I lost all these gates, I haven't been forced to send her to the Great Bastion. I've relied on other armies. So that's the early game. What about the late game? Okay, so this is turn 83. I have a uh, loaned army from the Western Provinces, so yeah, uh, a dead man walking. But I'll explain, I'll use this as an explanation for what you should be looking to do uh, past the early game, once you've got the graveyard, once you've stabilized the situation. You will need to maintain at least one army, not necessarily a very powerful one, like you can have alarming like this, just a couple of units, an allied units, all that. Uh, moving from Bastion to Bastion, uh, defeating Chaos Armies. Even when a major invasion comes in, a level 2 or level 3 gate will be able to repel them in the siege uh, pretty easily. Now, this is turn 83. Uh, when I got two great invasions, I think maybe three, either way, the last one I had had very significant armies of, of Chaos Marauders with trolls and such on, coming for me, so I actually had to divert a signif uh, significant force to deal with them. Not Miao Ying, she's been busy in the realms of Chaos and in the uh, eastern part of Cafe. Uh, not Miao Ying, uh, but rather a second army, uh, specifically this one. Though I did switch, uh, these units were on Miao Ying's. Uh, in Miao Ying's army, and I switched them to her because I gave her the all of these celestial, uh, these Jade Warrior Crossbow Man, these, um, and, and I've recruited the Fire Rain Rockets and Terracotta Sentinels from. I really like the Terracotta Sentinels. They're a pretty solid units. They are not giants. They are significantly better than what uh, any giant. They'll do more damage. They'll stand better in melee. All that. Like some some people would dislike them because they would die easily to range. Yes, that they would. But guess what? You have one of the most powerful. You have probably the most powerful range faction in the game. Kislev is better at the kind of like melee range fight. You are better at the pure range fight if you build an army like this, or an army like this. Anyway, <clears throat> with that in mind, so uh, for me, the early game uh, point where I basically started winning the campaign was I had a major fight against several stacks of troops and only three stacks or three and a, uh, two and a half anyway I won that now you have clanition that starts in Taitsu you want to deal with them for your brother like just get rid of them you also have you also have several other concerns you have clan spittle here in the north on the imperial road you have orcs over here at the village of the moon now the celestial loyalists may deal with the orcs but they're probably not going to be able to deal with the with the skaven 
and they're gonna lose significant force. That's gonna be the thing that keeps them occupied for a significant amount of time. And I'm pretty certain because you have the orcs and Skaven, that it's likely that Creative Assembly has already built the idea that the Celestial Loyalists are gonna become a playable faction at one point. And then you have the Jade Custodians holding the Celestial uh, Riverlands, pretty much. The Celestial Loyalists will start at war with them. They're gonna spend significant resources fighting them and lose time. What I did here, I confederated all of these factions, the Imperial Wardens, the Celestial Loyalists, and the uh, Jade Custodians, the confederated all of them, got their, all their territory. So, um, you deal with the Rebellion, you deal with the Graveyard, you solidify the situation at the Great Bastion. By the time you've done it, and you want to do this as quickly as possible, because then turn 32 is going to come up and you're going to have the first soul. Now, some people like Legend of Total War is like, don't care about it, don't play the campaign and that, I'm like... Yeah, if you're capable of wiping out all the other major factions, sure. Not all of us are Legend of Total War. And not all of us are capable of playing the game in such a... And the way he is able to. I would say he's a really good player, but he also abuses the crap out of the cheese in the game. So not all of us enjoy playing the game like the way he does. He enjoys painting the map. If you want to do that, fine. Personally, I'm playing the objective. So I've got two, two great souls. Uh, I'm... Uh, the only one other guys who have uh, two souls are the are, is Nurgle, and Nurgle is actually becoming one of the dominant threats. Like he has a lot of territory here, and he's ending stack after stack against me, uh, specifically. Not that Nurgle is much of a threat for cafe and battle. I'm not worried about Nurgle uh, Nurgle's armies. I'm worried about the plague that these armies have. Like the pl this army is plagued, so if I engage in combat, likely I'm going to get the plague as well. So. <clears throat> Let's talk about the mid to late game. There will always be a rift near Nangao. There is also going to be a rift here near the Terracotta Graveyard. So what you want to do at by turn 32 is you want to have Meowing, a full stack. It doesn't matter what stack it is. It can be peasants. I had peasant, uh, peasant archers, quite a few of them, and some Jade Warriors. And you send that into a realm. The best realm to go for early on, because you don't want to spend too much time. The, the best realm is corn. The armies there might be a problem if you play the, play a battle. You are going to be using tactics like corner camping and a lot of cheese yourself. But you can, in three, four, five turns, get out of corn's realm. And other factions, yeah, ma the major factions will also go there. Take advantage of that. Once you secure a soul, so what I did personally is I went to the corn's realm, got out of there in like five turns or so, and then teleported, then used a rift. Uh, then used another rift to teleport into the east, and I beat the crap out of the Skaven, secured the Lerval lands, and I spent about 20 turns doing that, securing this entire eastern portion of it. This is safe. There's nothing that's going to happen in this region. There's The rifts will spawn, I'll close them. I have heroes in position to do just that. It's frustrating as all hell to do it, but yeah, I have heroes to close the rifts. So this is just the economic heart of my empire. All of this that you see, the Imperial Road, the Jade River, the for uh, Forests of the Moon, the Celestial Riverlands, this is just gold supply. My armies, I have one full stack here because you will reach a point where the Bastion can't just be defended by the garrisons. In fact, I'm pretty sure that at no point can they just be defended by garrisons. You need the flexibility of heroes. I have a full stack. Of crane, uh, crane uh, gunners, Jade Warrior Crossbowmen, Sentinels, and Fire Rain rockets here, with the level 21 heroes, just because, just because I want to deal with uh, the armies of Kurgans that are gonna spawn. They keep spawning. I also am facing attacks by Nurgle at this stage. He's marching armies here. Your concerns are gonna be Tsinch, uh, in terms of the major factions. Your concerns are gonna be Kairos, Nurgle. And Greasus. And Greasus is really the most frustrating of them all. Chances of maintaining peace between yourself and Greasus are pretty low. If you don't declare war on him or he doesn't declare war on you, likely your brother or sister, depending on who you're playing, will likely declare war on him. This is exactly what happened in my situation. The Western provinces declared war on Greasus. And that means I cannot send. I lost two caravans already. Not to him, I lost it to other things. But if I send the caravan now, he's he has several stacks of troops. Like, I've wiped uh, t uh, three of them out, or two of them out, weakened the third. This one had a major battle here. The battle here. Uh, he does have another one heading here to try and uh, save his top current stack. Now, 
Conquering the mountains of Morn is not worth it. Best case scenario is just You're make some deal with a minor faction, now. ogre faction. Give them the territory, get some deals going. Recruit ogre mercenaries if you so desire. That's probably your best bet, honestly. That's likely going to be your best bet. You're still going to have to deal with Kairos at the very least. Now, Kairos initially won't be much of a threat. His army, he's going to start with our army. He's going to be unstoppable for quite a bit of time with that army on the campaign map. But actually, that's in your favor. Because it means, well, yes, Kairos is always very fucking scary to go against in battle. It means he's just going to have a bunch of blue horrors initially. Once you defeat him once, he's not going to show up with blue horrors. He's going to show up with cast knights and all the other wonderful units. Now, in this case, he's actually suffered quite a bit. I managed to convince these fellows right here to declare war on him, so they've been fighting war with him. But that's all All that's allowed is just Nurgle to show up. Uh, Nurgle is frustrating. He's not a challenge. Kairos is something I actually dread fighting in battle because he can take down your army to half HP pretty easily in seconds. Nurgle will almost always lose against cafe, a cafe and range stack in every battle. Like, if I take this army against this army, I'll wipe the floor with them. Now, I won't do so because there's other concerns. Attrition, other armies, all that kind of uh, all that kind of stuff that would make me uh, hesitate in that. But yeah, I'm not going to do so right now. But you don't want to go in the cast ways, by the way. Regardless of what you do, you don't want to go in cast ways. Maybe take down these two settlements, the Iron Storm, the Red Fortress. But anything further than that, like maybe even the Foundry of Bones, is really not a good idea to head in, in these two regions uh, right here, the Fortress of Eyes or the Foundry of Bones, because that might attract Kairos' attention. You really want to avoid as much as possible going after Kairos or attracting his attention. You could, you could defeat him early on, but not necessarily recommended to risk that. Because even if you defeat Kairos, you're just going to get Nurgle. You're going to encounter Nurgle, and Nurgle re will want to kill you from the very start. So my my uh, uh, best case scenario, unify as much of CAFE as possible, make an alliance and then uh, military alliance with your brother or sister, and then together work to deal with the ogres. One way or another, you don't have to conquer. Like at this point, I don't have to do anything. Like I've won the campaign as far as I see it. Like at this specific stage, at where I'm at, I could literally just turtle up in my territories of CAFE, wait for the rifts to open, like either Nangao or Terracotta Graveyard or here in the Revelerlands, there's always a rift. Go into the Chaos Realms again and again and again. Get the souls one after another, win the campaign. And they can't, they, I will not stop me. If you really want to secure a soul very quickly, make sure you just have one army. And in camp stand, uh, stands preferably if you're going in Nurgle's Realm. But have an army. Go in the moment they spawn. You'll be faster than most of the AI, if not all of the AI factions. And having that speed will me ensure you win. I've got the Slanish so uh, Soul and the Corn Soul. So speed will be of the essence. And take the pressure off your sibling. Like if you're playing the Iron Dragon, yeah, you will want to get control of the Great Bastion. There's a reason you want control of the Great Bastion after a certain point, And that's armies of chaos can bypass it if you let them. You can almost always intercept them when they try if you're controlling the walls yourself. If an AI faction controls them, they will likely let them pass and ravage your territory. So right now... I'm keeping Chaos contained in the Chaos Wastes. I've got two Doom Stacks marching on the Ogres to finish the job that uh, the Emperor started, and I, uh, at least against the Greases, because he, well, he just became a target. I have a loaned army here that I'm just going to try and take Rim Top with, uh, with and reduce it to Ash, or maybe yeah, just conquer it. No, reduce it to Ash. There's another army heading here from of Ogre, so they're not going to be able to stand up against uh, this army. This is as close to an Ogre Doomstack as you're going to see on a campaign. Greece has had the similar army. I beat the crap out of it. Actually, no. Uh, there were two armies here. They were similar to this. Greece has brought a bunch of giants. Highly experienced ones. Beat the crap out of him. Twice, actually. Had a really nasty situation uh, with Kairos, and likely the AI, Nurgle, or Kairos, they're not going to be stupid enough to march against you from the Great Bash, and they know that's an impregnable. Like, the AI is not stupid in terms of marching against the world settlements. That's actually nice to see. The what they'll do is they'll march through the mountain, mountains of Warren. Now, here's the wonderful thing. You automatically have war declared on you by the demons, or you start the war automatically with the demons. The ogres do not. In fact, they may very well end up working against you. That's exactly what happened to me. Like, I was marching an entire army. I lost it. 
I marched an entire army. Pretty solid one. Pretty decently. A pretty decent one. It wasn't as good as this one, but it was. Uh, it didn't have the Off Sentinels or Dark Teller, but it, was, it had a bunch of uh, Jade Warrior crossbow or shields. I marched that and, and, well, had half of it Jade Warrior crossbow and other peasants. Uh, and I thought I would defeat Greases with Dire Dragon. And then Scene showed up, beat the crap out of me. I might have managed to escape with my hero and my uh, general, just them. The army was lost. But then Greases finished them off, so lost. A uh, pretty decent ranking uh, general and a decent ranking uh, hero. That was that was annoying. So I've declared a purging war against the ogres as a result of that situation. But again, you don't have to do it. The settlements here are not Child worth it. Best case, God. if you have to fight a war in the mountains of Warn, just give it to another ogre faction. And you might want to head west. Not quite as far as the Chaos Ways, just containing Nurgle. Just containing Nurgle. Or more importantly, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to open a path for my caravan. So that means I need to capture some of these territories, deal with siege, deal with all that. Capture these territories so I can have a path for my caravan so I can open trade again. Because right now, if I send a caravan, it's going to be wiped out. Either by a random ogre spawn that's going to be pretty powerful considering the threat level. Because that's one of the things that caravans have to deal with the threat level of region. Or they'll just encounter an ogre army and get wiped out by that. So what I'm trying to do is just secure the road. So I'm likely going to take the Misgorge, maybe even wipe out Greases completely. But I'm going to secure some of this territory. Finish off Siege. Siege has one region here, I think. They still have the Volary, but most of their regions are here in the Mountains of Morn as well. Uh, because of the war between them and the Ogre. So they're still dealing with that. Siege is contained. Nurgle is marching stacks that are just dying right now, but... He's still a pretty substantial threat. I'm the most powerful faction on the campaign right now. If I actually look at the strength rank, I'm the most powerful. Corn is second, no big surprise. Lanish is third. <laughs> Nurgle is fourth, okay. And the Disciples of Mogul, to fall that kind of stuff. So, mid game, I'd say secure North and East Cafe. Uh, you'll be securing East Cafe if you're playing the Iron Dragon. Uh, then the north. If you're playing as Miao Ying, you'll probably secure the north before the east. That's what happened to me. And then deal with the ogres one way or another. Keep chaos contained. Don't march against chaos. These regions are not hospitable. Beyond the attrition you're facing, the regions cannot be held. It's a waste of time, money, and resources. And it's not what the campaign requires. If you want to wipe out Nurgle, like if I wanted to wipe out Nurgle, I wouldn't invade from, from here. Um, like wiping out Siege, that would be pretty easy. Um, but if I wanted to wipe out Nurgle or pick a fight with Corn, if I was stupid enough, I just send Meow Ying through a rift, take some territory, start building Doomstacks, like say, like teleport myself to the Empire and start picking a fight with that. Maybe help Katrin get her territory back. Kislev does really poorly when you let them be controlled by the AI. But they do have a lot of threats, to be clear. Like she has Prague? Like right now, Katrin has Prague and, uh,. Kislev is under corn control, new management. She was reduced basically at, to these two settlements at one point, but then she got Prague. I think she made the deal with the settlers. Castalton is dead. I haven't seen or heard of him in any way, shape, or form. And that's what's going to happen. And that's how you play Cafe. Obviously, there's a lot more things to talk about, battle tactics, all that kind of stuff. But these are just the broad strokes of things you need to know when you're playing as Cafe. Cosine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.